everyone. Welcome to Cannabis is Medicine, What is CBN? Uh, so today we're going to talk about CBN, which is cannabinol. Uh, if you're not familiar with me, my name is Bonnie Goldstein. I'm a cannabis physician in Los Angeles. I've been a doctor since uh, 1990, and I trained in pediatrics uh, at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, uh, where I worked in critical care transport and pediatric emergency medicine after um, my training. And since 2008, I've been taking care of patients with cannabis medicine. Uh, I have some board memberships and advisory positions. And then this is my book called Cannabis is Medicine. So we're going to talk about cannabinol today. And so there's uh, not a lot of information. It's very understudied but it is an important phytocannabinoid, plant-derived cannabinoid. It was first isolated from hash in the late 19th century. Uh, it occurs as a, what we call byproduct or a breakdown degradation of THC. So as you can see here on the slides, you see the structure of THC and when THC is exposed to heat, light, or air, uh, a process of non-enzymatic oxidation takes place and converts the THC to CBN. So CBN is not usually um, uh, in a large amount in fresh cannabis. It is much more prominent in aged cannabis. Now, what are the known mechanisms of action? And again, I said it was understudied. We really don't have a lot of information on how it interacts with the human body. But we do know that it binds to the type 1 cannabinoid receptor and to the type 2 cannabinoid receptor, but not as much affinity or tightness uh, to the receptor as THC. And therefore, it doesn't have as much an effect as THC. Uh, for the type 1 receptor, um, it's been described in the literature that it has a 10 time lower binding affinity. So it's 10 time less, times less potent at the type one receptor, which remember is mostly in the brain and kind of accounts for a lot of the anti-anxiety, the intoxicating effects, the uh, pain relieving effects and so on. Uh, it is two to four times less tight at that CB2 receptor, which is mostly in the immune system in the gut and elsewhere in the body. Um, and also one thing we know about CBN is it inhibits the uptake of anandamide. So what does that mean? That means that it blocks your body from breaking down anandamide, which is your natural inner cannabis-like compound. Uh, THC mimics anandamide. Uh, CBN mimics anandamide somewhat. Um, anandamide is your inner cannabis. Its role is to help balance the messages being sent from cell to cell. So for instance, when there's a pain message, your brain kicks out anandamide to help lower and balance that message of pain. Um, additionally, we know that CBN works at what's called the trip channels. So the trip channels are what we call ion channels. They sit on a cell wall and they let ions like calcium and sodium go in and out of the cell, regulating the messages. So when we look at CBN, it has some activity at these various trip channels. And again, um, this helps regulate the calcium and some other um, ions in and out of the cell. These trip channels are pretty much everywhere, and they kind of overlap with your endocannabinoid system, nervous system, gut, immune system, skin, your respiratory tract, and they're involved in pain and inflammation and itching. They're also highly involved in cancer um, and the growth of cancer, invasion of cancer. And so especially you see if you look over here at this trip m 8 CBN is a potent antagonist, meaning it blocks that receptor. And in blocking that receptor, it promotes anti-cancer effects. Many of the phytocannabinoids are antagonists or blockers of the trip m 8 And um, this confers some of its anti-cancer activities. By no means is it the only anti-cancer mechanism for phytocannabinoids. But this is all we really know about CBN. Again, I said it's very understudied. Um, what else do we know? So let's just go through some of the research. So I broke it down into the categories of what we can expect in terms of a clinical effect. 
So the anticonvulsant activity in a mouse model uh, showed that it uh, did decrease generalized tonic-clonic seizures um, as effectively as Delta-9 THC and CBD, and this is from the 1970s. Also, um, here's something that was uh, published just last year in 2022, potent neuroprotective and antioxidant activity. So CBN directly targets mitochondria, which are like the powerhouse um, producers of energy in your cells, very important to cellular function, to everything that you do. And CBN preserves key mitochondrial functions, including redox regulation, calcium uptake, membrane potential, bioenergetics, biogenesis. So what does all that mean? The functioning of your cells. And so CBN does this at least partly by the promotion of antioxidant defenses. So very interesting. And again, this is not special to CBN. THC does this, CBD does this, but CBN has also been found to do this. And here's another study acted as an antioxidant and decreased cell damage in a test two model of Huntington disease, which is a, a genetic neurodegenerative disorder that causes uh, dementia. So very interesting. And remember, many plant compounds, what we call phytonutrients, act as antioxidants, but here's proof that CBN uh, does this. Here, we're going to talk about the CBN and the anti-cancer effects. So the first report was in 1975, where CBN was found to be anti-cancer against lung cancer, the same study uh, that they found THC to be anti-cancer as well. And this goes back so long ago, 1975, right? Other studies show preclinical anti-cancer effects. That means in the test tube or in animals, in bile duct cancer, what we call cholangiocarcinoma, in prostate cancer and in breast cancer, multiple studies there. And really interestingly, CBN inhibited a mechanism that allowed cancer to develop resistance to chemotherapy. So it kind of helps uh, keep that cancer in check and not be able to build up that resistance. Um, again, this is in a preclinical, not in human clinical trials. What else does CBN do? So anti-inflammatory and analgesic. So in a preclinical rat paw inflammation model, it was found to be anti-inflammatory. It was also effective at reducing pain in a rat model of TMJ, which is temp temporomandibular jaw syndrome and fibromyalgia. Also, interestingly, it had potent anti-glaucoma effects. It reduced inflammation that caused elevated intraocular pressure. And again, this is an old study from 1981. Other effects include antibacterial, where it was found to be highly effective against lots of different bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, including what's called MRSA, which is a uh, very difficult skin infection to treat. Uh, CBN also acted as an appetite stimulant in, in a couple of studies, um, including this one in 2012, where it increased hunger, food consumption, and feeding time. And think about this. So CBN is less potent than THC. And there's a cancer patient who really doesn't like the effects of THC or doesn't have access to THC. They might be able to get CBN off the hemp market uh, or from a uh, licensed dispensary to help with appetite with ha without having that full-blown effect of THC. And then another study looked at um, CBN and what's called epidermolysis bullosa, which is a very difficult skin condition where the skin kind of blisters and breaks off. It almost looks like the person has burns all over. Um, they have ongoing studies with the first, what we call a phase one study, looking at um, safety and tolerability. CBN was well-tolerated and safe uh, in that first study. And uh, here's a link if you want to look at it um, to a uh, phase two study to see just how effective uh, it can be. Now let's talk about CBN and sleep. This is a big, big topic. Lots of people selling CBN saying it promotes sleep. And he's, here we have an article that's titled Separating Fact from Fiction. So let's go over it. Um, there's really no evidence that CBN helps with sleep. Um, IV CBN, so in this study, they actually put an IV in people and gave CBN through the IV. Please don't do that. Uh, they gave very high doses and people felt the high. Remember, it works like THC, just less potent, but sleepiness wasn't seen. 
And that was from 1973. And another study from 1973, they gave six healthy volunteers oral CBD, so taken by mouth, between 20 milligrams and 400 milligrams. They didn't see any effects. But remember, when you take uh, CBN or really any phytocannabinoid orally, it's very low absorption. So that may be why they didn't see any uh, THC-like effects. Now, here's a study also from uh, the 70s. Five male volunteers got six different study drugs. So they got placebo, or they got CBN 50 milligrams, or they got THC 25 milligrams, or they got a combo of CBN 12 and a half milligrams and THC 25, or CBN 25, THC 25 milligrams, or CBN 50 and THC 25. So lots of different alone or in combination. And what they reported was they felt drugged, drunk, dizzy, and drowsy, but only with the combinations when THC was present, but they didn't see it, or THC by itself, but they didn't see it with the CBN alone or the placebo. And CBN did not cause drowsiness, and it really wasn't any different from the placebo. Now, here's another study from 1975 where they gave 20 milligrams of THC combined either placebo or THC 20 milligrams and CBN 40, or THC 20 milligrams and CBD 40 milligrams. And they have 15 male volunteers. They found no difference between the THC placebo combo and the THC CBN in terms of um, what those volunteers felt. Now, another study, here's one from 1980. So human volunteers given THC, uh, CBD and CBN in 20 milligram doses each alone and in every possible combination, okay? And this is what they report. There was no suggestion of systemic effects involving CBD or CBN, either alone or in combination with other drugs. And then in another study in 1984, in a, um, they were trying to see if CBN caused what we call bronchodilating effects. So we know that THC can help open up airways. Sounds counterintuitive, but remember, um, THC works differently uh, through the cannabinoid receptors opening and other receptors helping to open up uh, airways. And in fact, THC used to be prescribed many, many years ago uh, for asthma. And studies show in very tiny doses, THC can cause what we call bronchodilation, opening of the airways. So they decided to look to see if CBN opens the airways, and they did. Um, they they gave it to 59 experienced, that should say male, M-A-L-E, sorry about that, smokers, uh, who were uh, given CBN in 100 milligram doses, 600 milligram, or 1200 milligrams, and no high or sleepiness seen by any of the participants. So in this report, and uh, in another one I'm going to show you, Basically, the summary of all the research, there's insufficient published evidence to support a health claim related to sleep. In my medical practice, THC works quite well for sleep, especially if you get a sedating terpene profile. Um, THC plus CBD, like in a one-to-one -one ratio, can also help people with sleep. Um, however, in my experience, I have not had a lot of patients say, that CBN help with sleep here and there. I think there's a placebo effect. Oh, here's some CBN and it will help you sleep and you go home and sleep, that's okay too. But understand that it is one about one fourth the potency of THC. So you might have to take a much higher dose, which certainly might be more cost costly for you uh, to take that dose when a lower dose of THC uh, might be better for sleep. Uh, now, I just wanna mention CBN and autism. So there is no research on this. But in my practice, I get a lot of patients who have many difficulties, who are um, uh, not always responding to what the literature shows for autism, which, you know, about half kids respond to CBD dominant products. Some respond to combination THC, CBD. I also use other compounds like CBG. But um, I haven't really used CBM very much. However, I've started using it just in the last year. And in some of my patients who do not get as good results with other cannabinoids, CBN seems to be helping them. Less aggression, less hyper, better focus, better sleep, less self-injurious behavior. Parents reporting, hey, this is working for us. Uh, dosing would be similar to THC, starting very low dose and titrating up in small increments, looking for that sweet spot. And of course, 
In some patients, you may see similar side effects as THC, but you may not. Remember, these studies giving fairly high doses uh, didn't really report a lot of um, THC type effects, but potentially you could see sedation, increased appetite, red eyes, or agitation. Um, I want to show you here two studies uh, reported at clinicaltrials.gov, which is the website where you can see what clinical trials are going on. And you can see number one here, they're using the uh, cannabinol CBN cream for treatment of epidermal lysis bullosa. That's the one I've already mentioned. And that's, I believe, out of Europe. And then here's a second one. And this is out of um, Australia, cannabinol in use with patients with insomnia disorder. And you can see here they're recruiting. They're going to try 30 milligrams of CBN compare it with 300 milligrams of CBN and placebo. So hopefully we will get some updated information rather than relying on studies from the 70s and 80s. So very exciting to see this research. Of course, I'd love to see a whole list, but I'll take the two that are there. And then if you're interested in reading an article about CBM that goes over everything that I've talked about in a little bit more depth, there's this very nice article that came out October 22. Uh, you can go to Google Scholar and just type in the title, Cannabinol History, Th Synthesis, and Biological Profile of the Greatest Minor Cannabinoid. Um, or you can go to PubMed and put in the title or the uh, author, and you should be able to uh, get a free copy of uh, this article. And then I just wanted to show you my book one more time uh, where I go over a lot of this. And I just want to thank you for your attention and uh, see if you can subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel. Take care, everybody.